The Cambrian Period The first chunk of time in the massive swath of time known as the life-bearing Phanerozoic Eon is known for a slew of rather small animals. It was a time when larger multicellular life forms were first diversifying after all. However, as time progresses and more fossil material is uncovered from across the globe, it turns out that not only was there really no Cambrian explosion, but there were a lot more animals of unusual size than historically assumed. A brand new one has just been described by an acquaintance of mine and a paleoartist and paleontologist many of you may recognize. Let's meet his new baby, Mobula Vermis. If you are aware of the mimetic concept of the Cambrian explosion, it's the Cambrian explosion then you are likely at least vaguely familiar with the friendly faces of the first animals that appeared during this time. These critters are all from one huge chunk of rock known as the Burgess Shale, which is located in British Columbia. What many may not be aware of is that Cambrian-aged fossils are now known from over a handful of really good fossil sites and more than a handful of good to poor sites worldwide. These layers of rocks have been producing amazing bounties from the beginning of life as we know it and have been opening up a world that was far more complex than traditionally thought, when the Burgess Shale was the only good window into the world of squishy invertebrates. The adorably goofy and prickly little Hallucigenia is a commonplace critter in many a Cambrian diorama. It belonged to a large but somewhat ill-defined group known as the lobopods, so named for their many stubby limbs, which are referred to as lobopodus in nature, or simply lobopods. As of the making of this video, the lobopods lasted from the early Cambrian to the Carboniferous. They varied wildly in their integumentary accoutrements, though all were worm-like and many-limbed in some form or another. Some, like Fasivermis, were burrowers, with all of their little limbs near their head and a long body ending in a stubby base to adhere to the sediment. Many crawled around with the help of clawed feet and carried an array of spines on their backs, like the various species of Hallucigenia, Lualishania, and Collinsovermis. Most carried much smaller spines and tubercles over their ringed or annulated skin. This group is controversial only because it's not yet known for sure exactly how each of its many members are organized and organized with regard to the many known relatives and possible relatives. These critters are some form of panarthropod, which is a really big group that contains the Onycophora, the velvet worms, the tardigrata, or just tardigrades, and the arthropoda, or basically every single invertebrate you interact with. There are a few different ideas on how the lobopods should be organized if they are all each other's closest relatives and not an unnatural grouping of critters that should belong to their own unique groups, of course. The major division among the known lobopods and lobopod-like critters is between the more velvet worm-like forms and the gilled and finned forms that carried a pair of huge spiny arms on their heads, not entirely unlike the radiodons, like the Cambrian poster child Apex Predator Anomalocaris. The radiodonts were definitely closer to the arthropods than the softer lobopods though, having sclerotized or hardened skin and armored shields on their heads. Cannot forget their rather more complex eyes too. These charismatic, soft-bodied, spiny, undersea creepy crawlies are popularized as Cambrian oddities that popped up in the Cambrian explosion and quickly died out as superior armored sea beasts surpassed them. However, the last few decades of fossil excavations have shown that both the lobopods and the radiodonts were major players in Earth's ecosystems for quite a long time, at least geologically speaking. As I noted before, some lineages survived into the Devonian and Carboniferous periods. Fossil bias may play a major role in why more are not found in later rock layers too. 
If a small handful made it into later time periods, it would be logical to assume many more did as well and just haven't been found or just never fossilized. Among the new discoveries of Cambrian weirdos, very few belong to non-radiodont lineages. There are three species that belong to a group called the Siberiidae, Megadictyon, Janshanopodia, Siberion, and possibly one more. There are the Guild Lobopods, Kerygmachella, Pamdelurion, Utonax, and Omnidens. And then there are the Opabiniidae, which was just the trunked Opabinia for a long time before the recent additions of Myarithurin and Utaurora. Those arm-headed Siberiids may have been the first raptorial predators to ever evolve. Meanwhile, the Opabiniids are completely unique. Who knows for sure exactly what they were doing? And now, a brand new form of guild lobopod has been described by Christian McCall, or Prehistorica as he goes by online. Prehistorica is one of the top paleoartists around today and has the monopoly on early Paleozoic invertebrate art and knowledge. He has also been involved with Paleo Rewind at least once and has his fair share of uniquely artsy paleontology videos here on YouTube. His work, in which he is the sole author, has been published in the prestigious Journal of Paleontology. Two specimens of a guild Lobopodian were uncovered from the Ruin Wash locality, located on the west side of Chief Range, 17 kilometers west of Panaka and the Pioch Shale of Nevada, all the way back in the 1990s. This layer of rock dates from the early to mid-Cambrian and is considered Elagastata, a special sedimentary rock deposit that preserves incredible details of things that died in it due to various unusual depositional characteristics. These are the deposits that preserve soft tissues in most circumstances. The Pioch Shale was further divided into smaller layers of rocks based on the types and ages of rocks, among other things. The older rock layer's fossils are preserved as batrioidal hematite, an iron oxide mineral that looks like grapes. The younger rock layer's fossils are preserved as carbon films. The fossils of the new Lobopodian were labeled as coming from the younger rock layer, but the fossils are preserved in that batrioidal hematite. On top of that, a similar situation had occurred before with a specimen from Anomalocaris magnabasis and many other fossils. So, McCall determines that these fossils most likely belong to the older layer, named the Combined Metals Member. This makes the fossils from the Diran stage of the early Cambrian, about 516 to 513 million years ago. So, here are the two fossils. The holotype KUMIP298510 is a large part and counterpart of the animal's rear end. The second specimen, the paratype KUMIP298511, is also a part and counterpart of the rear end, but this one is, you know, it's a little smaller. Unfortunately, that means there isn't much here to get a perfect idea of what the animal looked like when it was alive, other than filling in the blanks from its closest known relatives. However, Christian McCall was able to identify enough traits preserved in these fossils to separate it from its relatives. So, he named the new animal Mobulovermis adustus. This name comes from the genus name of the living manta ray, Mobula, in reference to the swimming flaps of these animals, plus the Latin vermis, which means worm. The species name is Latin for burnt or singed or sunburnt, which refers to the bright, fiery colors of the fossils. Once all of the anatomical traits preserved in the fossils of Mobula vermis were tallied up and put into the phylogenetic software of McCall's choice, it was found that Mobula vermis forms a family grouping with Kerygmachella and the recently described Utonax, with Kerygmachella being the most closely related to the new manta worm. McCall therefore had to construct a new family for these guild lobopods, the Kerygmachellidae. This helps to further organize the lobopods, since, if you recall, the term is loose and may refer to various groups of animals that are more or less related to one another. Omnidens and Pamdelurion, which may be the same animal, were found to group most closely to one another as they usually do, but if more are found to do this, another family may be needed. 
Mobula vermis, and Kerygmacella. Both feature swimming flaps that bend down and to the sides, as well as a roughly cylindrical body and a long tail spine with no flaps. The similarities between the two critters allows for some phylogenetic inferences to be made of what the rest of Mobula vermis may have looked like. It's likely the animal had compound eyes on the bottom of the head region, a mouth that faced forward, and huge raptorial arms sticking out of the front. These features, combined with lack of walking limbs, suggest that, like its close relative Kerygmacella, Mobula vermis spent its life swimming about in the water column. Mobula vermis strays from Kerygmacella in having a lot more flaps that are broader and in a denser arrangement. Mobula vermis's flaps also seem to decrease in size towards the tail until they disappear before the tail spine. Before we move on, let's bring in Mr. Man from Animal Planets The Most Extreme to get an idea of how big these animals were. According to body length equations and comparisons with other more completely known relatives, McCall thinks Mobula vermis may have reached 30 to 50 centimeters, 11 to 20 inches in length, depending on the accoutrements that it used to find its way around. McCall thinks it's safer to stick to the conservative length of 30 centimeters here, though. Thanks, Mr. Man. So, why is Mobula vermis significant? The entire concept of splitting up the gilt lobopods from the other lobopods centers around them having both flaps and lobopodous limbs. These small bumps that lined the trunk of Kerygmacella, aside from the big flaps, were always interpreted as limbs, but a paper published in 2022 described a new lobopod from Cambrian, Utah that shows something a little different. The paper names Utahnax after an incomplete specimen that preserves some flaps but no limbs. The paper's authors, Rudy La Rossi Abril and Javier Ortega Hernandez, found that the body cavity of Utahnax extends down into the body flaps, which means that the flaps are really modified limbs, similar to the flaps seen on the bottom of the body in the radiodont arthropods, Anomalocaris and kin. This means that the flaps of these animals are not homologous. They do not share a common ancestor to the dorsal flaps of many of the other lobopods and offshoot arthropod groups that are related to the lobopods, such as Opabinia, Pamdalurion, and possibly Kergimichella. Their paper suggests that ventral body flaps have evolved convergently multiple times as different groups of these early arthropods shifted towards predominantly swimming, predatory lifestyles. Mobular vermis is extra important here because it basically confirms the hypothesis proposed with Utahnax, meaning that Kergimichella also likely didn't have legs. Its flaps evolved from them. Pamdalurion still has legs, so this means the flaps evolved multiple times. Unfortunately, that's about it for this critter, two halves that continue to help broaden the understanding of the lobopods and where they fit into greater invertebrate evolution. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.